Hello and good morning, everyone. I am Eleni, and I'm here with Professor Tom Coyen from the Ghent University in Belgium. Welcome, Tom. Good, good morning. Yeah. So for everyone that is listening today, uh, Professor Tom was a guest editor for the joint uh, thematic issue, Eurobio Films, past speaker at the FENS Congress 2017, but he's also giving a plenary lecture today at uh, 2 p.m. CET on uh, metabolic adaptations as drivers for antibiotic tolerance in microbial biofilms. So without further ado, I will move forward and ask you the, the first question that I have for you today. Can you walk us through your current area of research and uh, what are you investigating at the moment? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm currently leading the, the laboratory of pharmaceutical microbiology here at, at Ghent University in, in Ghent in, in, in Belgium. In this research group, we are, uh, or we have several research lines. The first one um, focuses on, on fundamental aspects of microbial biofilm formation. Um, we try to get a better understanding on how microbial biofilms form, and uh, we're especially interested in, in gaining a more fundamental understanding in, in the mechanisms behind the tolerance and, and resistance to antimicrobial agents that we observe in these, in these microbial biofilms. And from this, this fundamental part, we, we try to, to make the translation uh, to, more, to more applied uh, microbiology as well. We try to translate these, these um, novel insights that we, that we obtain in, in, in our basic understanding of, of microbial biofilms. We try to translate that into novel concepts for treating biofilm-related uh, infections. So that's the first um, research uh, line, uh, and then a second obviously related research line that we're exploring in, in my laboratory as well, is uh, investigating the, the interaction between microbial biofilms and, and the hosts um, to see if we uh, also, in, in, in that regard, we, we start from, from trying to get a, a better fundamental understanding in the factors that, that govern these interactions, but also there try to make the translation to um, to translate these findings into, into something that could be useful to, um, uh, to, to uh, guide uh, novel approaches to, to treatment of various diseases. So that's, in a nutshell, what we do. So you mentioned about uh, general life, but uh, do you test that in specific pathogens? So uh, what kind of pathogens are you kind of focusing? Yeah, so, so we do research on, on a lot of different uh, organisms. Uh, so maybe first I should say that, that historically biofilm research has really focused on, on single species uh, biofilms, so biofilms formed by one bacterial or, fer or, or fungal species. Of course, if we look at, uh, at biofilm-related infections, we often see that these are polymicrobial. So if you take, if you take biopsies or you take samples from, from infected patients and you look at these in the laboratory, you will often find different microorganisms um, that, that live very closely together. So we gradually, and the entire field is gradually moving away from, from focusing on, uh, on single species biofilms only. And so in a lot of our research, we are using polymicrobial biofilms because we know that the interaction between the different organisms is actually important as well. And not only the interaction between the different organisms, but also the interaction of the entire community with the host is, is important as well. So we do study, um, quite a, a few different uh, organisms. Now the thing is, we have two, I would say, two main, or maybe three, but but um, uh, main areas of interest. So so number one for sure is is the respiratory tract. So a lot of the research we do focuses on respiratory tract respiratory tract infections. We have a keen interest on uh, microbiology in in the lungs of of patients with cystic fibrosis, um, uh, which which as you know. These patients are very susceptible to, to respiratory tract infections, and these respiratory tract infections are, are often biofilm related. Um, so this is an important area for research. Um, so um, that guides us a little bit towards the, the organisms that are frequently found in, in these patients. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is, is, is probably number one there. We do quite a bit of research on, on that one. But we also look at, at some of the, the, I would say, the not so usual suspects that we find there. And I have a long-standing interest in, in Burkholderia uh, bacteria, and then mainly the bacteria belonging to the Burkholderia cepacea complex, which are also uh, respiratory uh, or also pathogens uh, that are found in the respiratory tract of cystic fibrosis patients. 
much less frequent than, than Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So historically, they have been they have been understudied a little bit, as is often the case. I, I did my PhD on these bacteria. I, I, I you know, stumbled upon them uh, really by uh, by coincidence, I would say, uh, and they've stayed with me for for my entire career so far. So that's also one of the reasons why we, we like to why why well why I like to keep on on studying them, especially since there's still a lot to to discover uh, about these these bacteria. And so this is a respiratory tract, uh, one focus. And then we also have a keen interest on biofilms in, in the context of chronic wound infections. And then a bit more recently, also an interest on uh, in, in biofilms um, and, and all kinds of, of, um, on all kinds of medical devices, going from endotracheal tubes to prosthetic joints, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we do study quite a diverse uh, collection of, of organisms here. What stayed with me is the, that you said about the uh, polymicrobial uh, biofilm. So I think um, it's uh, it matches better with what actually occurs uh, during an infection. So it's not often one bacterium that it's present, but it's the interaction between different ones. So um, that's uh, very, very interesting. So obviously we talked about uh, different pathogens, but uh, for you, what is like... Um, one of the most fascinating or your favorite uh, pathogen and for what reasons? Well, I think I gave it away a bit in my in my previous answer, of course. Um, no surprise there. Again, I, I have been working with, with Burkholderia cepacea complex bacteria since since 1996. Um, I would, yeah, that's yeah, 1996 when I started doing my, my PhD work with, with, with Peter van Damme. And, and so I, I, you know, you you start working on these organisms, you you learn more about them, and it's a really and and as I said, I mean they stayed with me uh, ever since. Uh, it's a, it's an intriguing group of organisms. Uh, why? Mainly because these are actually environmental bacteria, plant associated bacteria um, that have some very interesting properties. For example, they have very large genomes. Uh, that is a bit atypical for for bacteria. Uh, they have three three chromosomes, um, so their genome organization is is uh, is a bit unusual. Uh, they produce a lot of secondary metabolites, probably secondary metabolites they need for competition in the soil uh, with other bacteria. And at some point, these bacteria have been able to make the, the jump from from this this environmental plant associated lifestyle uh, to to become a human pathogen. Um, and, and these are really opportunistic pathogens. They will, they will, if you're a healthy uh, person uh, without an underlying condition, they will not make you sick. But for example, in, in cystic fibrosis patients, uh, they can have very, I mean, an infection with Burkholderia cepacea complex bacteria can have a very negative outcome and, and, and can often lead to, to death of the patient. So it's that, it's that two sides of the bacteria. I mean, they're plant associated, they produce all kinds of secondary metabolites. Um, some of these secondary metabolites have really interesting properties like antifungal and antibacterial properties, but at the same time, it's, it's a pathogen that can have, have very, um, a very negative effect uh, or have result in a very negative outcome for, for infected patients. So it's the different sides to, to, um, to the same bacteria that, that make them, that make them uh, interesting. I think. Talking about the mechanisms of resistance, what is something you want to share with everyone about antimicrobial resistance? It can be related to, to the pathogens that you were studying, but it can be also a general, um, your thoughts about antimicrobial resistance. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that are that are that are obvious, of course, but that are nevertheless um, worth worth repeating, um, maybe especially in in, in these challenging times. Um, so first of all, when we look at when we look at the numbers of, of um, um, antimicrobial or infections caused by by, by antimicrobial resistant uh, microorganisms, and if we look at the numbers of antibiotic use, we, we we still see that this is high, too high. So I think this is this is the number one concern. Uh, we recall we're of course all concerned and, and rightly so for the moment with with, with a certain viral infection. Um, but but let's not let's not forget at this point that that uh, many people die every year worldwide uh, due to infections with with antimicrobial resistant antibiotic resistant microorganisms bacteria and fungi, and so this is a a, a major health uh, concern a major health issue that will stay with us um, uh, for for many years to come, uh, and and so there have been estimates that that. Uh, 
by 2050, actually worldwide, more people may die as a consequence of an infection with an antibiotic resistant bacteria than, than people that would die by, uh, due to cancer. And again, I, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to do these, uh, to predict these, these numbers in, in the distant future. But if you look at these studies, I mean, it's clear that this is a problem that, that will have a, a, a long lasting uh, impact. So it, it, deserves, it deserves attention. Um, it deserves continued attention in, in, in different areas. I mean, we, we do need new antibiotics. So we do need new forms of partnerships between, between governments um, super, at, the, at the supranational level and, and, and pharmaceutical industry. That's one thing. We do need uh, to to uh, make make uh, general public, uh, but also uh, people in, in, in various uh, levels and various uh, parts of healthcare to be very aware of the problem. Um, and we need basic research. So I think we 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 do need we do need investments in, in in these areas. We need investments in coming up with new antibiotics. We need investments in in, in uh, public awareness. And we do need investments in, in basic research uh, to figure out, to, to, get a, to, to get a better understanding on, on what is causing this, and also to get a better understanding of, of potential solutions to this, uh, to this problem. It's a problem that's going to stay with us for a long time, so it deserves uh, all the attention it, it, uh, it really needs. Now the um, coronavirus pandemic, um, which kind of shows us that, that, that uh, pathogens are really something small creatures that are hidden and we sometimes do not pay enough attention to them and uh, sometimes they um, can we can be really bad for the environment for humans uh, in general so uh, what do you think the um, the coronavirus pandemic has uh, taught us about how the scientific community responds to crisis uh, what do you think we have learned <laughs> Well, that's a very difficult question. I mean, it, it's difficult and, and easy at the same time. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to formulate a, a definitive answer. Of course, it's easy because there's so many, so many aspects to it. I, I think uh, if you look at it purely from a microbiological point of view, of course, it, it, as you said, I mean, it, it makes people aware that there are microbes out there that can have a huge impact uh, on, on, on our daily life. I mean, as microbiologists, we all knew that. Um, uh, and the, the general public was probably not so much aware of that uh, until until um, beginning of, of, of this year. So so that's that's one thing. Uh, I don't think it's a good the good thing, good thing um, that that as microbiologists we will never have to convince people again that that microbes can have a big impact. So that's uh, that's a plus. Um, uh, secondly, of course, what what have we learned as scientists? I mean I mean I, I think what, what we have learned as scientists. Um, goes broader than just microbiology. I, I think we have learned as scientists that it, that it turns out to be extremely difficult to, um, to implement evidence-based decisions. Um, we have learned as scientists that it's extremely difficult to convey the, 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 the scientific evidence to, to people in power, to governments, to people that make the decisions. Uh, that, is not, that, is, that is not easy. Uh, that I mean, we have seen that in all different countries. Um, so that is, that is something uh, we have learned as well, I think. Uh, and 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 we probably should should um, yeah. I, I, there's no solution. I mean, that there's no easy solution for that. But we we probably should learn from this, uh, both we as scientists, but also uh, the, the people in power, governments, people that make the decisions should learn from this as well. Is how that how that uh, evidence-based policies. Um, can can uh, be implemented in in a, in a in a better way than it has been done over the last couple of months. I would say. Um, I think as scientists, we we find it we find it. Well, we think it's a, it's it's evident. I mean, you if there is evidence and you 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 think it's the most logical thing to to implement that and translate that into into policy. What we have seen is that is not the case, and 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 that is of that has been frustrating for scientists. Um, and at the same time, it, it, it probably has been frustrating for policymakers and the, and the broader audience that the communication that comes from the scientists is not always been been completely coherent. And and because that's the way science works, we are as scientists, we we are used to to have doubts. We are used to discuss and, and look at things from different from different perspectives. 
Um, but of course, that doesn't translate well if you want to move to policy making or if you want to implement strict measures uh, in public health safety, etc. So I think we we learn a lot as we as we go. But hopefully, we will we will remember these lessons for for uh, future crises that may happen. Yeah. I will now move to a more lighter topic because we talked a lot about the research and about AMR and COVID. So I know that a lot of attendees at this conference are early career scientists. So what piece of advice can you give uh, uh, to them having passed through that stage of your life and being an established researcher now? Yeah, that's that's that is that is a bit of a difficult question. Um, first of all, I think I think general advice from from me to to a large group of people. I'm not sure whether whether that's. I mean, I, I'm not sure whether you should follow my advice in general. But anyway, um, I, I think I, I can I can I can highlight a few points. I, I, I think um, and this also this also goes back to to my own uh, career. Of course, uh, you also you always you, know, you reflect on things that happened in your own past and. and and, and, and try to come up with advice based on that. So, so that's also the limitation. But anyway, uh, I think it's it's crucial that that uh, early uh, early career researchers, um, people that start in research, um, you need to find a topic, something that that really interests you. But okay, I mean, microbiology is so broad, and, and science is so broad. I mean, there's always going to be things that interest you. So. Probably rather than than if you if you choose a direction to to start working in, I mean, it's probably not so important or not so crucial that it's that exact topic because you want to work on that. But maybe uh, what I think is, is is probably more relevant is that you look at the research environment where you will be working in. Um, this is something that has gained a, a bit more attention over the last couple of years. But I think good mentoring is is really important. And good mentoring can take many forms. So, so don't expect any specific advice on uh, on that from from my side, because I think um, I've, I've personally had, had very good mentors that have very different styles, and and, and 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 so you have to find something that that works for for uh, for the two parties involved. But um, if you if you if you have the possibility to talk to people that have been working in a lab before you join that lab, talk to them. Talk to them and, and, and ask. Okay, what is what is the culture here? How is how does mentoring work? Uh, um, is is are people supportive here? Is there a positive lab culture instead of a toxic one? I think these these are things that are very important um, because people. What you see is sometimes that people think, okay, well, this doesn't seem like a great place to work, but the topic is interesting and they have some high impact publications, and so I will be able to make a career here. But I think it's much more important that you work in an, in an environment where you can be happy, in an environment that, that fits you. And again, this can be different for different for different people. So I'm so this is not a general guideline like it should be like this. But you should find a place that matches with with your um, ambitions, with with your personality, and a place that you think where you can be happy uh, and productive at the same time. So that's maybe the, the I think that's probably the, the most important advice because if you if you start um, um, if you start your your scientific career in, in a good way, I mean that's great, and that and that and that um, may create the right conditions for you to continue in science. If you start your scientific career with a with a very negative experience, um, yeah, then that's really a pity for all parties involved. So so um, yeah, try to avoid that at all costs. That's probably the the best advice I can give in that regard. Thank you for the advice. I think. It's very important to, especially now, to think about the environment that we are in and uh, to make sure that we have uh, good mentors. So moving on to a very different topic, and this is going to be my last question for you uh, today. Um, so who is your favorite microbiologist and uh, why? Well, it's a very, I mean, I, 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 I knew you were going to ask this question, of course. So it's, a, it's a tricky one. Eh? It's a tricky one. Yeah, I mean, uh, microbiologist about the favorite microbiologist <laughs> no no i mean i don't want to insult anyone no i mean uh, so so I, I gave this i, I mean I, I gave this some thought and, and and i think um you know um i i, I decided to go with with uh, with bill costerton uh, bill costerton was a uh, he passed away a couple of years ago um so bill costerton was a was a canadian um microbiologist uh, he, did, he did most of his, his 
uh, later scientific work in, in, in the United States, and who actually was, I mean, his own, was the pioneer or the godfather, whatever you want to call him, of, of biofilm research. So, so he, he actually came up with the, with the concept of, of, of biofilms, uh, published some, some, uh, some very important, very influential papers early on in his career, and, and stayed in the field uh, until, until, until the end of his, uh, of his career. So his scientific impact has been uh, on, on the field where I'm working in has been has been enormous. So that's that's that by itself I think is is a good reason to to pick him. But on top of that, he was a he was a very uh, a very uh, generous person. Um, I, I met him quite early in my career. So so my my my, my first step in steps in microbiology were actually in microbial taxonomy, uh, and and so I switched to the biofilm field, well, microbial taxonomy, then some some molecular epidemiology. And I switched to biofilms a, a bit later. Uh, I saw the light. Uh, let's, let's call it like that. Um, and so I was I was making my first steps in in that in that in that in that new um, discipline within within microbiology. When I had the pleasure to to meet Bill Costeton a couple of times at international meetings, and and so I had no track record in that field. Uh, nobody knew what I was doing, who I was. But and and, and there he was, like uh, the guru of the field. And he always had a very open mind, not only to me, but also to other young researchers, people that came into the field. He was, he was very approachable. He would give you advice. He would introduce you to, to other people. He was, um, he, was, he was just very generous. And, and I think that, that um, of course, that, that, is, that is, goes back to what I said about mentoring. Um, that creates a very positive atmosphere. Uh, and I think that, um, I, I like to think, um, that that has actually uh, set the stage for the for the, the microbial biofilm field. Of course, there are there are always discussions, and not everybody gets along great. But overall, this is a field that is very collaborative, um, very open in terms of sharing information, very open in terms of setting up collaborations. And I like to think that that uh, at least partially is due to to um, you know the, the legacy of of, of Bill Bill Costetan, who who started doing it that way. So for that reason, he is my favorite microbiologist. Very, very interesting answers from you today, Professor Tom. Um, so we started hearing from your career. We moved to antimicrobial resistance. We talked about um, coronavirus and some piece of advice from you for our early career scientists. So I would like again to remind everyone uh, that uh, Professor Tom is going to give a talk today at 2 p.m. CT on uh, metabolic adaptations as drivers for antibiotic tolerance in microbial biofilms. So thank you again, Tom, for being uh, here with me in this interview, and I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, Eleni. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye.